I'm Joe. Today on Next Level Bullshit, we take a look at water fluoridation. Yep, the biggie, the Moby Dick of conspiracies. Everyone has an opinion on it. It's a neurotoxin. It's a toxic waste byproduct. Ha, it's rat poison. Or Hitler used it on the Jews. Wait, no autism? Oh. Oh. Thanks, Mercola. This is one of the messiest topics we've seen. Tons of misrepresentation, agendas, and doom. Agendas that range from selling water filters to a global elite eugenics conspiracy. To understand this mess, we have to go way back to 1901, when Dr. Frederick McKay opened a dental practice in Colorado Springs. He immediately noticed grotesque brown stains on the natives' teeth, but he could not find any studies on the phenomenon. Locals blamed the issue on a myriad of things. Too much pork, inferior milk, or too much calcium-rich water. Renowned dental researcher, G.V. Black agreed to help Dr. McKay after a study showed that 90% of Colorado Springs inhabitants had brown stains on their teeth. And working together, they made the first important discovery. Teeth affected by the brown stain had far fewer cavities. The next big break occurred in 1923, when Dr. McKay, along with Dr. Grover Kempf, a U.S. public health rep, traveled to Bauxite, Arkansas, a town immersed in aluminum production, to test a hypothesis about the brown stain being correlated to water supplies. At this point, the chief chemist of the Aluminum Company of America, H.V. Churchill, is shitting his pants. There's a U.S. public health rep sniffing around local water supplies. He had just spent years refuting claims that the aluminum cookware was poisonous. So, he preempted the researchers with his own sophisticated analysis that found high levels of fluoride existed within the water supply. Months later, the link was officially established. High fluoride levels caused mottled enamel, or dental fluorosis. In the 1940s, Dr. Trendley Dean, head of the dental hygiene unit at the National Institute of Health, spent years building off Dr. McKay's work. He discovered that fluoride levels of up to one parts per million in drinking water had not caused enamel fluorosis in most people while still preventing cavities. The first large-scale community water fluoridation research project took place in 1945 at Grand Rapids, Michigan. After 11 years into the 15-year study that monitored 30,000 school children, Dr. Dean discovered that the amount of cavities fell by 60%. By 1962, the United States Public Health Services recommended that the public water supplies contain between 0.7 and 1.2 milligrams of fluoride per liter of drinking water. That's about the same as two drops of liquid in a 55-gallon drum. The most popular fluoridation compound is currently hexafluorosilic acid and it's salt sodium hexafluorosilicate. Sodium fluoride, the compound many have pointed out is in rat poison, isn't used anymore. So shit, there goes the eugenics conspiracy. There you go, a little history lesson. Now, let's take a look at some bullshit causing all the confusion. Starting with the two most popular anti-fluoride arguments. I'll let Alex Jones introduce this one. Fluoride from Alcoa's aluminum smelter at Portland is making kangaroos sick. Well, why not just put it in the water supply? Oh, that's what you do. It's the byproduct from the purification process of aluminum manufacturing and the byproduct of fertilizer manufacturing, and you just dump it in our water. That and over 150 chemicals on average. Okay, starting with the aluminum claims. Aluminum fluoride is a colorless solid that can be prepared synthetically, but also occurs naturally, that is used in the production of aluminum metal. It is not a toxic byproduct, but an important additive for the creation of the aluminum used in commercial products. That's how chemistry works. Combine compounds and a variety of methods to create cool shit. But what about the claims about the phosphate industry? 
Flora apatate is a naturally occurring impurity in apatate, a mineral used in the manufacturing of fertilizer, and is composed of calcium, fluoride, and phosphate. During production, hydrogen fluoride is produced as a byproduct. This byproduct is a minor industrial source of hydrofluoric acid. A scrubber is used to trap the hydrofluoric gases, and when the scrubbers get scrubbed, fluorosilic acid is recovered. The compound is packaged to be sold off to a variety of industries, including the aluminum industry and municipal water fluoridation. But what about the Nazis? Now this turd is fucking everywhere. It all comes back to a guy named Charles E. Perkins, who wrote the book, eh, more like a pamphlet, The Truth About Water Fluoridation. Perkins allegedly had contact with the German chemist at IG Farben, the fourth largest chemical company in the world at the time, and played a crucial role in the Holocaust by supplying Zyklon B, a cyanide-based pesticide to Nazis to murder millions in gas chambers. It has been reported all over the conspiracy web that Charles Perkins wrote in a letter to the Lee Foundation for Nutritional Research. Repeated doses of infinitesimal amounts of fluoride will in time reduce an individual's power to resist domination by slowly poisoning and narcotizing a certain area of the brain and will thus make him submissive to the will of those who wish to govern him. That claim is repeated all over the web, but there's never any originating source or corroborating of any kind. However, it's reported that he wrote in his now impossible to find pamphlet Mass medication involving fluoridation of public water systems has long been known as an important technique of the communist philosophy of mass control. In the end, there is zero proof of this connection, but it is perpetuated by almost everybody. So what about the health risks? This shit's all over the map. There are two studies that are commonly used. The first is the Harvard School of Public Health impact of fluoride on neurological development in children. This meta-study looked at 27 studies in China where naturally occurring fluoride levels in water are very high. The study found a drop in IQ equivalent to seven points. The researchers concluded with, the results support the possibility of an adverse effect of high fluoride exposure on children's neurodevelopment. Future research should include detailed individual level information on prenatal exposure, neurobehavioral performance, and covariance for adjustment. They indicated additional research is needed, and a follow-up study was just released last month. It's titled Association of Lifetime Exposure to Fluoride and Cognitive Functions in Chinese Children, a pilot study. The abstract was released on the National Institute of Health's website. The full text isn't available to everyone but the published conclusion is a bit ominous. This pilot study in a community with stable lifetime fluoride exposure supports the notion that fluoride in drinking water may produce development neurotoxicity and that the dose dependence underlying this relationship needs to be characterized in detail. That sounds pretty scary. So we opened our wallets and obtained the full study where we confirmed that the fluoride levels in much of the Chinese well water studied were compatible with the levels of fluoride ad added to municipal water in the US. And they concluded, we are planning a large scale study to better understand the dose effect relationships for fluoride's developmental neurotoxicity in order to characterize the appropriate means of avoiding neurotoxic risks while securing oral health benefits. Let's set aside these findings and come back in a bit. The next study often used is the 1990 U.S. Toxicology Program Bioassay for Fluoride. The study dosed rats with various amounts of fluoride. Among 50 rats that were dosed with 45 parts per million, one developed bone cancer. Among 80 rats that were dosed with 79 parts per million, four developed bone cancer. That's a shit ton of fluoride, and only 8% developed cancer? That doesn't seem so terrible. It's actually very difficult to find actual cases that confirm the adverse effects of ingesting fluoride. There's one case I stumbled upon. A 47-year-old woman developed skeletal fluorisis by consuming way too much fluoride because she drank a lot of green tea, a batshit crazy amount equal to over 100 tea bags a day. 
Green tea contains naturally high amounts of fluoride. In fact, just about everything you consume has some amount of fluoride unless it has been removed. Oral health is a big issue. Fluoridated water wasn't fully embraced by the United States until after World War II. When it was realized that a majority of rejections for military duty was because of poor oral health, which is a serious issue. It can affect your entire body, even causing heart disease, diabetes, and there are over 8,000 cancer deaths a year linked to poor oral hygiene, something that is exceptionally preventable. The dental health industry is a $129 billion industry in the US. Without a history of fluoridated water, it could easily be double that. So we can't call bullshit on the huge financial gain on keeping fluoride in the water. Based on the huge body of evidence, we were prepared to conclude that the health benefits of fluoridated water outweigh the risks. But that just recently study from Harvard was our tipping point. Repeatable results that fluoride in water reduces IQs in children, even when it's within recommended levels of fluoride in drinking water. Based on this week's old study that focused much more than cavity prevention in children, it's probably time to put a halt to adding fluoride to municipal water supplies. Brain health is far more important than dental health, especially in children. But we're still going to take the task, all the knuckleheads out there that created overwhelming confusion with bogus claims, exaggerated pseudoscience, outright lies, and hysterical doom porn, which are nothing more than tactics to get attention or to sell products. Tactics usually based on outdated information. You people created an environment that made it nearly impossible to parse through the bullshit and find reliable information. So you're extreme bullshit for injecting crazy into this important issue. But there's exaggerated bullshit on the other side. The notion that the lifetime cost of one decayed tooth is over $6,000 is absurd. And that's a certain strong bullshit. Oh, 38 on water fluoridation. Respond in the comments if you think I'm right or I'm fucking wrong. Our last episode, of the Trans-Pacific Partnership had a lot of cheerleaders. Preston Smith said, if corporations are people, they should be executed. Their assets seized and given back to the people within the countries they have a footprint. 777 said, face it, these corporations and governments are going to continue to squash the people as long as the people let them do it. And that's no bullshit. Trevor Wilson hit the bullseye with, sounds like, get ready, here comes the big dick. And A. Salmon's added, please don't ever cut your hair. It's beautiful. Aw. So what's the total today? Nine. Hmm. In episode 36, we passed $100, and I promised to show my donation in this episode. But this show took a lot of work, including Google search results with really nasty looking teeth. Next week, I promise to have a confirmation. Now, if you find a story that is bullshit worthy, post it to any social media site with hashtag NLBS. Or if you're really motivated, make me a video. And if we like it, we'll use it for our next segment. You can also email me anytime at joe at nextlevelbullshit.com. Follow us on Twitter, subscribe on YouTube, and watch all our shows on nextlevelbullshit.com. And don't forget to go to thenlbs.spreadshirt.com to get shirts and other cool swag. Until next time, if you're a downtrodden jihadist in the Middle East with no future prospects other than beheading infidels, there's good news. The Obama administration wants to find ways to get you gainfully employed. Seriously, that's a new strategy.